Welcome to Sapiens Dialogues, an original podcast from the Centro Nacional de Investigación sobre la Evolución Humana, which brings together specialists in the study of our origins to help understand our past, our present, and our future. Episode 5, Children of the Sun, Vitamin D in Human Evolution. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Sapiens Dialogues. This is an original podcast from the FENIE, where we seek to bring together FENIE researchers and scientists that are considered like experts in their fields from all over the world. Um, this is the case today, as you will see. My name is Maria Martinon Torres. I am paleoanthropologist. I am the director of the National Research Center in Human Evolution, the FENIE, where we are at today. And my research has mainly focused on the study of the dentition of the hominins that inhabited Europe during the whole Pleistocene, with a very special focus in the Atapurka sites. But because my background is in medicine, I have also developed an interest in evolutionary medicine and the extent to which medicine can really provide some light to understand our past. And this has been also covered in a recent book, was a popular science book called Homo Imperfectus, where I have tried to bring together all these aspects, medicine and paleoanthropology. And this is the reason I am particularly excited about the guest we have today for our Sapiens Dialogue. This is Professor Robert Martin. I know he will allow us to call him Bob. He's the way he's really known by everyone. He's Bob and everybody knows who we are talking about. And he would not really need to be introduced. That He is one of those that can be called a Pope, in this case, in the field of primatology. He spent 15 years as director of the Anthropological Institute in Zurich. Then he moved over to the Field Museum in Chicago. And since 2016, he is academic guest at the Institute of Evolutionary Medicine in Zurich. We are very honored to have Bob here. He has been our distinguished annual lecturer uh, here at the anniversary of the CNE, and that's why we are lucky to have him in person at CNE. And, well, hello, Bob. Welcome, and thank you so much for joining us in these Sapiens Dialogues. And, well, how is everything going? How is your visit to Spain, to Burgos in particular, so far? Yes, you know, I followed the discoveries at Atapuerca for a long time, right from the very first publication, uh, the finds of Shima uh, Los uh, Huesos. And uh, I've always wanted to come here. I didn't imagine I would ever get the chance. And I certainly didn't think it was possible to visit the fossil sites. I thought they were inaccessible. And I had a simply wonderful day yesterday because I visited the facilities here at the center, and they are stunning. This is really state-of-the-art science. And then seeing the fossil sites, 150 people working away, <laughs> uh, they must produce things pretty soon that we've never heard about before. And uh, this is a beacon for human evolutionary studies in Europe. I, I've never seen this kind of operation before I've seen a lot of things, but uh, you really need to be congratulated on what's been achieved here. It's it's miraculous. Okay, that's, that's great to, see, to hear. Thank you so so much for it. We both were sharing a, like a medical twist in in our way of approaching in human evolution. No, so we were both like highlighting how important indeed it was to take into account health and disease to fully understand the the history of, of our lineage, isn't it? I've always feel that these two fields have like evolved separately and they should be much more connected to understand our past. Yes, as you mentioned, I, I'm now an academic guest at the Institute of Evolutionary Medicine in Zurich. That was only founded about eight years ago, so it's a young institute and it's thriving. It's a really exciting place to be. There are people, most of them with medical backgrounds like you, and uh, using evolutionary biology as a, a source of ideas for cum curing human disease conditions. Today we have decided like talking about something that is very important in general, not only for scientists, but I would say society because we are like still perhaps seeing the light at the end of the tunnel of this epidemic with the COVID. 
But it seems that now society is very aware of health and disease and vulnerability, no? So we make more questions indeed about our health status, how, how we are vulnerable or not. We thought we were a very successful species and we now feel that we may not be as strong as we thought. And in particular, talking about epidemics, uh, we're going to be talking about vitamin D and how indeed this vitamin D we are all familiar with, uh, how this need of vitamin D has been a driving force in many aspects of the evolution of our lineage and that this vitamin D is very, very important. But there is a sort of silent epidemic. So there is really a, a world epidemic in the deficit of this vitamin D, which I was, I don't know, maybe you can tell me <laughs> better numbers of the ones that I'm familiar with. But I will say that they say that 70 percent of European populations have something like vitamin D deficiency. And even for Spain, which we, we consider ourselves, no, the, the país del sol, like the country of the sun, like half of population have a deficit of vitamin D. So that's a real situation, isn't it? Absolutely. Uh, one thing I want to say at the outset, I mean, you use the word epidemic. I would call it a pandemic. We're just coming out of a pandemic of uh, coronavirus has lasted over two years. And uh, vitamin D, as you said, is a silent pandemic. It uh, it's affects uh, enormous numbers of people around the world. And probably... Vitamin D deficiency has killed far more people than coronavirus uh, over time because it's gone on for years and years and is really worldwide uh, in its reach. Uh, to me, it's a classical example of uh, evolutionary medicine because the background to vitamin D deficiency is an evolutionary one. Very clearly, we originated in Africa as a uh, as a species, uh, um, a bit further back as well. Uh, so our lineage is is imprint, imprinted with conditions in Africa, and one of those is sunlight. And there is abundant sunlight in many areas in Africa, unless you go really far south. And uh, so people generally don't uh, suffer vitamin D deficiency in Af in most parts of Africa. And that's how it would have been for our ancestors. And then for some reason we moved uh, particularly north but also south. And the higher the latitude, the less sunlight there is available. And the other problem is that uh, it's seasonal. So uh, if you go further north than 40 degrees latitude, uh, for three months in winter there is not enough sunlight to form any vitamin D at all. So for us, uh, living uh, further north than that uh, means that we are uh, struggling uh, to have enough vitamin D. So uh, if we're lucky in the summer, we form enough to carry us through the winter. Uh, vitamin D is a fat-soluble vitamin, and so you can store it very easily. But I should now explain what vitamin D is. Yeah, exactly, because we, we, we always hear about vitamin D and we always have this idea that vitamin D like other vitamins are just complements that generally are recommended for people to take in because it can improve their health but it seems that we are talking about something different and indeed we know it is different or maybe we can explain people that when we talk about vitamin D is like we're talking about the superpowers it's, it sounds like it is something else than just a vitamin isn't it? Vitamin D is unique among the so-called vitamins. Vitamins, uh, that's a term we use for substances that are vital for existence. And uh, usually you can obtain them in the diet. You mentioned supplements, and uh, I, my general feeling was that uh, you get enough vitamins in your diet if, if you eat a proper diet. And uh, so uh, there's no real need for many people in the north to, to take supplements. But vitamin D is an exception. And it's often said that it's a, a, as much a hormone as a vitamin. It's, there's no other vitamin that uh, also behaves like a, an important hormone exactly. in the body. Exactly. So it's, uh, it's important in many ways. Practically all cells in the body, even in the brain, have vitamin D receptors to make use of vitamin D for vital functions. And so... Uh, uh, vitamin D is special and you need sunlight to form it that's the other unique feature about it 
um, uh, precursors in the skin under the influence of ultraviolet B light will form vitamin D. And that is how we naturally get our, most of our vitamin D. A key point is that it's very difficult to obtain enough vitamin D through the diet. And that is what makes it so dangerous uh, uh, with respect to getting a deficiency. The main sources in diet are uh, oily fish. Mm -hmm. And so people who live on the coast and eat oily fish generally tend not to be uh, vitamin D deficient. So in Scandinavia, for example, Sweden and uh, Norway and so on, they are pretty far north. And uh, you might expect them to be vitamin D deficient, but because they eat lots of oily fish, they're, they're mm. okay. The other primary source is uh, egg yolk. Yeah. And that's a pretty narrow dietary range to yes. <laughs> get enough. So if you live inland uh, with no access to fish uh, and you're far north, then you've got a problem. And this is, uh, in fact, if you do surveys today in uh, North America and in Europe, uh, at least 80% of uh, people are vitamin D deficient and some seriously vitamin D deficient. They, they don't have enough at all. This is interesting because, as you say, this is one of the best examples of evolutionary medicine. And many times when people ask, why do we still get sick if we are evolved, if you are evolving? And and somehow it's posing like a mismatch between our biology and the new lifestyle or environmental we all homo sapiens live, and which is quite different from the original environment where we originate, like was, as you say, in Africa with a style of life in outdoors, when we were getting this enough radiation we need to to produce the vitamin that we need. So somehow we are the same, with changes, but the same homo sapiens we were trying to adapt to a completely different environmental, seasonal, different latitudes. And in that sense, of course, we all think that vitamin D, you no, know, the classic idea we have in our minds that if you don't have vitamin D, what you get is rickets, is this this condition where we really have uh, alterated the, the bone growth and development, we get these bold, soft bones and all these problems, but, but it seems that there is something else, no? That really vitamin D has had an impact in many other vital processes, like, for example, human reproduction, which at the end is the key event <laughs> for a successful species, is, is to get reproducted, to have babies, and it seems that not only with rickets, uh, but vitamin D really has a, a direct effect on our basic vital function, which is uh, having offspring, isn't it? So can you explain us a bit more this aspect? Yes, as you say, the classic example of uh, for vitamin D deficiency is rickets, which is a disease of the bones. Vitamin D plays an essential role in the incorporation of calcium into bone. So if you if you lack vitamin D, then uh, your bones are not going to harden as they should. And so there are pictures from just a century ago where you can see babies with bowed legs and, and arms, and their their bones are really almost flexible. It's 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 tragic to see, and that was uh, recognised fairly early on in medical history that vitamin D was essential. And a lot of people have got the idea that rickets is the only thing to worry about. Uh, but the first point is you have to be really deficient in vitamin D to get rickets. I mean, practically no, no vitamin D in your diet, and then you get these classic symptoms. And it was relatively easy to uh, boost not just vitamin D but calcium in the diet to make sure people had enough. And uh, vitamin D was added to various foodstuffs, but... Uh, generally, uh, that has lessened. People uh, generally believe it's not so important, and uh, there's a silent pandemic going on, and it's it's not sufficiently recognised in uh, medical circles that it is a major problem. And one of the biggest problems uh, with it is that the darker uh, somebody's skin, the less vitamin D they can form, even if they have access to sunlight. So in uh, uh, in North America, the black uh, African African black uh, 
uh, people who were uh, enslaved and, and taken against their will to the north. They are the people who suffer the most from vitamin D deficiency. And it's generally known that in, uh, in the United States, for example, people with uh, dark skin, particularly African Americans, uh, have more disease problems than uh, Caucasian white uh, members of the population. Uh, but nobody mentions vitamin D as a factor in this. So vitamin D is really, relatively cheap. It would be very easy to give everybody supplements of vitamin D at low cost, and the problem would go away. Yeah, but why? Why is this measure not being taken? It would be relatively easy to, I, to really I do protect not understand it. Things. One of the problems is that medical science has set certain values. The World Health Organization gives a certain range of values where you need to be with your vitamin D uh, content, and uh, that's too low. There's lots of research indicating that you should at least double the values that WHO and uh, doctors around the world are, are citing. And so they're underestimating the problem with the dosage rates. Uh, uh, you cannot easily get up to the levels necessary. And only recently I found out about D, uh, vitamin D levels in hunters ga and gatherers, people living under relatively natural conditions. And they have vitamin D levels in this higher range okay. that I regard as essential. And so uh, my doctor kept telling me I was fine with vitamin D. And once I'd read a certain amount of research papers, I realized that I needed not. to go above that. <laughs> so that's the thing. There are many things. I, for example, would like to highlight something. Uh, uh, this is a topic that we are very aware of, which is the role that vitamin D has in the immune system. Yes. If we really look at evolutionary medicine, we see that many of the changes our species has gone through in, in, in our short history of 200, 300,000 years are really those trying to reinforce our immune system, that the big challenge indeed for our homo sapiens is to try to cope with uh, defense to new pathogens, to new challenges. Indeed, we even know, for example, that from our interbreeding with Neanderthals, this one to four percent of of genes that we keep from this integration represent more than the fifty percent of the genes that in our system are involved in the immune system in the defense. So it seems that it, this is like the the leading force for our evolution is to defend ourselves from from infections. And we have seen this related, for example, with with the COVID. And indeed, if I am not wrong, it has been said that this lack of vitamin D may have even an impact in, in, in our susceptibility for COVID uh, disease, isn't it? Absolutely. You've really put your finger on the core problem here, which is that the immune system depends on adequate levels of vitamin D. If you don't have enough vitamin D, you're generally more susceptible to viruses and uh, to cancers as well. And in fact, a classical example involving the immune system is multiple sclerosis, which is a degenerating disease where, where it's an autoimmune disease where your own immune system is attacking your nerve fibers. And uh, it, it, uh, one of the uh, simple indicators that you have a problem with vitamin D is, is simply looking at maps of the occurrence of certain diseases If you look at the United States, but, uh, multiple sclerosis is twice as common in the northern states of the United States than in the south. And that is directly correlated with the amount of incoming ultraviolet light. And so epidemiologists recognized fairly on uh, that this was true of cancers. Cancer of the colon shows exactly the same distribution. The further north you live... Uh, in the United States, the more likely you are to get cancer of the colon. Cancer of the prostate is similar, breast cancer. And so uh, cancers, which are tied up with the immune system pretty closely, also show an association. One of the problems has been to get hard evidence that you need vitamin D uh, to protect you against multiple sclerosis and cancers. And what you need medically... Uh, to be fully sure about things is, is to have uh, 
uh, randomized controlled trials that show that people who re- receive a supplement of vitamin D do better than people who don't. And the evidence isn't there uh, convincingly enough yet for medical science to accept that there is a causal link. My view on this is because of vitamin D is so cheap and there is good circumstantial evidence that it's important, I think we should all be taking vitamin D supplements uh, to get our levels up to where they should be so that our immune systems are optimized. And uh, I, I have a, a colleague, a primatologist in uh, North America. Uh, his wife is Brazilian and his daughter mm-hmm. Uh, developed multiple sclerosis at 23, which is a very early age to develop multiple sclerosis, typically comes later in life. And they spent two years trying to find a medical solution in North America. And then they heard about a, a physician in Brazil who was giving massive doses of vitamin D. And his daughter is now cured. Now, this is just one um, case, and uh, we, what we need is hard evidence. A single case isn't going to get us anywhere. But I've heard, come across so many individual cases of that kind that I'm convinced that there is a causal connection. This is really, really very, very interesting and sometimes even scary, scary you know? Why are we not really acting on this, on this aspect, which is so important? And... From an evolutionary point of view, I always explain no, that this, this vitamin D is really this need, something like a driving force behind many of the mutations that have been positively selected throughout our evolution of our species. And for example, this need of getting enough <laughs> vitamin D is behind uh, mutations like our uh, tolerance to lactose, for example, no, when we, mostly through the Neolithic, we became... Like farmers, we were having next to us this very easy source of vitamin D through the milk that was provided by cows and animals. And we really favor what it seems to be an anomalous thing in our species as a mammal is that we keep digesting milk as adults. So this is quite of a, a special situation because it was a, a mutation that was selected because it was favoring for us to get the vitamin D, we were not getting enough through the, the radiation. And we also have, as you know, very interesting research here at CNE, like colleagues like Leslie Aglusko, who are working in, in quantitative genetics. And she's also highlighting how important is uh, this need of supplying to babies through breastfeeding enough vitamin D. Uh, to children, and it seems that there is a mutation mostly in Northeast Asian populations where they are not really getting enough sunlight. That seems this mutation of the either gene is favoring like getting higher density and ductal branching for this breastfeeding. So it's always like vitamin D behind, no? Like, like driving this thing. And I would like maybe just to, to finalize this, this dialogue, this conversation to highlight from an evolutionary point of view. The skin color change, no? It seems that from the moment we left Africa, which were likely dark skin colors to protect ourselves from the damage that an excess of UV light can do to our skin. We are always hearing, uh, you have to protect your skin from the sun. You have to avoid uh, all this skin cancer. So it seems that we are always like drawn between two forces, no? The, the compromise of protecting ourselves from cancer of skin, but at the same time to get enough radiation for getting the vitamin D we have. Seems our skin color has been changing many times. So there are many mutations that have been making our skin darker or paler, depending on the place where we live or the diet we have access to. And I always think, I don't know what's your point, that this is also a very nice example to to put aside maybe a bit of an obsolete concept, which is the one of race, no? And racism is really thinking that humans can be categorized in very static, fixed boxes based on features that seem to be so flexible and adaptive, like skin color, for example. Isn't it that... Well, if something has been changing that is not really defining capabilities of people, that is indeed a very nice example of how our nature tries to adapt to a changing environment, an environment that we have mostly changed ourselves. 
Yes, uh, there's some been, been some wonderful research by husband and wife team, uh, Nina Jablonski yes, and exactly, George Cutler. Yes, Cutton. beautiful work. And they have demonstrated convincingly, I, I think, that uh, uh, ultra B, ultraviolet B light, uh, ultraviolet A is not uh, of any value. It has to be ultraviolet uh, B. And uh, the uh, incoming quantity of ultraviolet uh, B uh, maps beautifully with skin color around the world. And so the interesting thing is uh, when people left uh, Africa, uh, migrated out of Africa to Eurasia, then skin color decreased. Mm -hmm. So we became paler. But the thing is, if you then cross the Bering Straits and get into America, you can then migrate down to the southern tip of uh, South America. So a lot of South America is at at, uh, relatively low latitudes, relatively near the equator, uh, the equator, and you get dark skins re-emerging uh, in a different way. So this is true, uh, always true when convergent evolution occurs, that you get a similar effect. The skin becomes darker, but it's in a different way to the original coloration of the skin. So it is flexible, as you say, if it depends on where where you live for long enough. If you live long enough in the north, you're going to develop pale skin. And if you live uh, long enough in a tropical region, you're going to develop a dark skin. And it, and it, it's really very uh, vague. The boundaries are very uh, soft. One of the key problems with racism in relation to real biology is that there are no sharp boundaries. The classical racist approach thinks uh, you can put people into boxes according to skin color and so forth. Everything grades across. And so, uh, and you know, there was one beautiful study early on that showed 95% of human variation occurs within a population. Mm -hmm. Yes. And only 5% uh, relates to geographical differences between people. We're all pretty much the same. We're very much the same species, yes. and the, and the f- few minor gene differences between human populations are trivial. And of course, the big problem with racism is associating that with a, with t- regarding some people as superior and others as inferior. Mm-hmm. Because of something exactly. totally trivial, trivial such as skin color. Yes, <laughs> yeah. So I think this is a, also a beautiful message uh, to send people, and maybe to round up this this dialogue. You no, know, these differences, like in something like a skin color, has been really a good example of how we adapt or we try to adapt for survival, and that those differences should not make uh, boundaries between what we are all the same species, which is Homo Absolutely. sapiens. And yeah. well, I don't know if you could say that we are all part of maybe a species that we could be called the children of the sunshine. No, we really need this this sunshine, yeah. and that would be the way we should see each other, these homo sapiens. And, well, thank you so much. But well, uh, yeah. there's one key point that's important to mention, because uh, uh, if you look at people, what you see is that in uh, southern, in tropical regions, people have dark skin, yes. typically, and they have no problem forming vitamin D because there's plenty of incoming sunlight. And as you move north or south from the equator, skin color uh, becomes paler. Mm. But the question is, why do you lose uh, pigmentation? Uh, You can understand why you need it in the tropics, because it protects you having too much Mm -hmm. ultraviolet light, which can damage genetically the, the skin. But if you're moving north or south... Why don't you just keep the uh, pigmentation? This is the big question that Nina Jablonski and uh, George Chaplin tackled. And it looks as though there is a trade-off. There's a trade-offs are an important point in evolutionary medicine. Quite often there are different pressures and they have to be balanced. Yes. And the balancing factor seems to be folic acid, which is very important in reproduction, uh, in Hmm. pregnancy, for example. Folic acid is easily destroyed by uh, uh, ultraviolet light. Yes. And so if you if you move north, uh, there's less ultraviolet light and you don't need the pigmentation to keep the ultraviolet light in uh, coming in. And so you, 
you uh, despite the low level of ult- ultraviolet light, you get enough by removing the pigmentation from the skin. Mm. And but the ultraviolet light is not enough to damage folic acid within the tropical regions. The pigmentation stops you from getting too much ultraviolet light. It's a very interesting story. It is interesting. Yeah. And did we see, you know, we're always in this battle, you no, know, these compromise uh, solutions, you no, know, to try to, to balance exactly. dangers and benefits of, of the same Exactly, feature, compromise. No? And I just want to uh, point out uh, in, uh, at the end of this conversation, you mentioned COVID. Yeah. And the, the evidence, of course, is only just emerging. Uh, emerging. We've only had COVID for less than three years. So medical studies are really just beginning, but there are enough already to show that if you have plenty of vitamin D, you are far less likely to get the infection in the first place. If you do get infected, you're far less likely to die. If you have vitamin D in the range that I regard as optimal, and uh, that's uh, the one study showed that virtually nobody died from COVID above a certain of le- level of vitamin D. Wow. And it's well known in the United States, African Americans have suffered far greater mortality than people with pale skin in North America. Nobody's mentioning vitamin D. This is quite surprising. <laughs> yes, the facts seem to be so clear, and then it's like we're not to me, taking yes. action. <laughs> Yeah, so I think, well, this is an interesting um, message and I think a good example of how the study of the past can also shed light on needs we have now at present. And, well, thank you so much, Bob, for being here, sharing with us your knowledge, for having this very interesting conversation. Entirely my pleasure. (laughs) And then, yeah, I hope, like, after this conversation with, of course, recent protection or uh, reasonable protection sorry like people get out outside and still make a bit happy the this hunter gatherer that we all still have inside and that is really claiming the the sun that we still need to thrive and and to live as a yeah as a children of sunshine that we are thank you so much I think I just as a take home message, I would advise anybody to have their vitamin D level measured by their doctor. Exactly. I think it would be the first starting point to realize yeah, about this silent oh. yeah, pandemic we, we may be going through. So eighty percent of people listening to this have too little vitamin D yeah, circulating. Exactly. So you that you are listening to us, check your vitamin D level and you may be surprised. And as you have seen today, there are many, many different aspects. This vitamin D has influenced the evolution of our species and many other species indeed, uh, hundreds, thousands of years ago. And uh, well, this is exciting to think uh, that at least there is something we can do about it, isn't it? So <laughs> let's do it. Yeah. Thank you. This podcast has the collaboration of the Fundación Española para la Ciencia y la Tecnología, FECIT, and the Ministerio de Ciencia e Innovación.